Hi, and welcome to Dr. Vanderbeen's AP Chemistry Podcast. Tonight we're talking about phase changes. Now, you already know a lot about phase changes. You know that going from a solid to a liquid is called melting, and going from a liquid to a solid is called freezing. You know that going from a liquid to a gas is called vaporization, and going from a gas to a liquid is called condensation. Now, there are substances that can go directly from being a solid to being a gas, and this is called sublimation. And when your food gets freeze or burn, it's because you were seeing sublimation of the water in the food. And going from a gas directly back to the solid state without going through a liquid is called deposition. So you're familiar with a lot of these and have seen these phase changes before. The reason we get phase changes is because we are heating or cooling the substance. We're therefore changing the average kinetic energy of the particles. So you can change the state of matter. Every time you have a phase change, you do have a change in the energy of the system. You're putting energy in or taking energy out. Now, one thing we can talk about when we are melting a substance is the heat of fusion. And the heat of fusion is the energy required to bring about a change from a solid to a liquid. So the heat of fusion, sometimes written as HFUS. So the heat of fusion is what we're talking about at the melting point, or the freezing point. I should point out that the magnitude of the heat of fusion is the same as the magnitude of the heat of freezing, but the signs are opposite. Mostly we just talk about the heat of fusion, um, whether we're melting or freezing, because it's usually the total amount of energy that we're interested in, and we can take care of the sign convention very readily, because we know that they're opposite. All right. I do want to point out that in melting, most of the intermolecular attractions remain unchanged. So you are taking your solid, which is very rigid and compact, and you're separating the particles so that they're now free to move. They're still relatively close together, and so those intermolecular attractions are still strong enough to be significant, but you still have dense states of matter. You can also talk about the heat of vaporization, and this is what we talk about at the boiling point. And the energy required to bring about a change from liquid to gas. Similarly to what we saw with the heat of fusion, the heat of vaporization is equal in magnitude to the heat of deposition. The sign is opposite. Mostly we focus on the heat of vaporization and um, don't worry about calling anything the heat of deposition. And we just, as I mentioned, take care of the sign convention easily enough. I should point out that the heat of vaporization is usually quite a bit bigger than the heat of fusion, maybe three, four, five times larger. All right, it takes a lot more energy to separate those liquid particles, which still have significant intermolecular attraction, and put them into the gas phase, where they're really not interacting with each other at all. So this takes quite a bit more energy to overcome all those intermolecular attractions. And that's really what we're doing with these phase changes. This graph um, just allows us to look at the heat of vaporization versus the heat of fusion. Right? For butane, uh, the heat of fusion is 5 kilojoules per mole. It's 24 kilojoules per mole to vaporize it. If you look at water, uh, the heat of fusion of water is 6 kilojoules per mole, and it's 41 kilojoules per mole to vaporize water, so a significant jump there. It takes a lot of energy to get substances into the gas phase, which is why you can have much worse burns from steam than from boiling water. Now we can diagram this as a heating cooling curve. So along the x-axis, we're plotting heat axis, heat added, and we're presumably adding it at a constant rate. And then along the y-axis, we're plotting the temperature. All right, so what you'll notice is from segments A to B, I have solid ice. All right, and then 
and from BHC, you'll notice I don't have any temperature change. I do have my phase change. So phase changes occur without a change in temperature. All right, so I've got melting going on between B and C. And then I have liquid water between C and D. All right. And then at D, point D, which is at 100 degrees, which is the boiling point of water at one atmosphere, I have vaporization occurring, another phase change, and notice it occurs without a temperature change. But the segment for DE is a much larger, larger segment than the BC segment because the heat of vaporization of water is quite a bit bigger. Once all the water has been vaporized and we've essentially broken all those intermolecular attractions, we have water vapor and we can increase the temperature again. So phase changes occur without a change in temperature, right? So B to C is a phase change, D to E is a phase change. Where you have a temperature change, C to D, A to B, E to F, you're heating the substance, okay. right? You're, and its kinetic energy is increasing. These are all showing temperature increases and the average kinetic energy of the particles is increasing as the temperature increases. All right. Now if you take the energy change for the phase change, you do the mass of the substance times its heat of fusion. Um, and this is for melting or freezing. That would be the amount of energy required or removed. If you are vaporizing a substance, as shown in segment DE, or condensing it. You're going to do the mass of the substance times its heat of vaporization. Of course, you need to make the units match, but these calculations are actually quite easy to do. All right. For the other segments, if you need to calculate the energy change, go back to our old friend Q equals mc delta t. You do need to make sure that the specific heat matches the state of matter. For that state of matter, um, they are usually somewhat different. Right. However, doing the calculations isn't really a big part of AP chemistry. You do need to be able to use Q equals MC delta T. Um, and as I mentioned, using the correct specific heat for each segment. All right, so the specific heat of ice is not the same as the specific heat of water which is not the same as the specific heat of water vapor or steam. All right. You would need to be given these. You are not expected to know these values, nor are you expected to know the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization or any substances. If you needed to do these calculations, you would need to be given that information, or maybe you'd be doing it just with symbols and not doing any numerical calculations. Um, but hopefully this gives you a sense of where we need to be able to go with phase changes.